Hi everybody, this is Joanne Manister, a blogger at Scientific American and a faculty lecturer with the School of Integrative Biology at the University of Illinois. And I am so pleased today to be joined by Monica Dunford, who is an experimental physicist who has worked uh, with the LHC and is one of the featured physicists in the fantastic movie uh, Particle Fever, which I hope you have had an opportunity to see. I saw it uh, in early May locally in a uh, theater in town and it was packed to the rafters. I was a little worried I wasn't going to get in, but I'm really glad I had the chance to see it. However, if you haven't had a chance to see it uh, coming around to your town, it is now available on iTunes uh, and will be available as of July 15th in other uh, video on demand services. So uh, go ahead and check out uh, particlefever.com if you want to know more about that. But let's go ahead and talk with Monica for a little bit. Uh, she's definitely one of the standout characters in the in the show. She seems very lively and running around and uh, biking and rowing and doing everything else in addition to um, you know working on the uh, actual machinery of the LHC. Uh, welcome Monica. Um, I would love to know a little bit more about what your research really is and uh, we'll get we'll talk a little bit more about the film after we do that. Okay well hi thanks for uh, having me here it's uh, great to talk about both the film and also about uh, my research it's always fun. Um, so yeah, I, I spent a lot of time let's say in the early years of the LHC actually doing a lot of construction work um, not a whole lot of physics, but really building the detector um, to actually do, you know, to study some of the fundamental uh, properties of, of particle physics. And so we spent, well, not me personally, but the, the we spent 20 years essentially building the detector. And um, after 20 years of building, 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 we finally turned it on. And the goal of the collider and the experiments is really to produce new fundamental particles of matter. And the one we were looking for the most, which was the Higgs boson, um, we discovered in 2012. So we basically slammed particles together and tried to produce the Higgs boson. And uh, after 20 years of building, um, we're successful. That's, that's really good. So that means that uh, you were probably very young when they started building. Uh, yeah, actually. Yeah, the original design report, the original uh, proposal was in 1979 for the LHC, and so that was uh, actually the year I was born, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was fate. <laughs> yeah, it was fate, yeah, you can say that, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, in th so, in the movie, uh, they can only follow so many people, like, I, you know, in documentaries, they can only follow so many, they can't follow, but there are hundreds, probably thousands of people who have been in on this project. Um, if, is there a way you can give us an idea of the scope of this project, the enormity of this project? Yeah, so I mean, if you're familiar with scientific papers, you know, usually you would expect a scientific paper to have a handful, two, three authors on it. Um, the author list for my collaboration alone is 28 pages long. I mean, you're talking name after name wow. after name. Yeah, so it has over 3,000 authors, um, and then wow. there are two big experiments. Uh, the two biggest ones have, um, so both that 6,000 physicists just there on the author list, but then of course you also had probably another five to 6,000 people who were technicians or, um, you know, students, uh, summer students would come for a couple of months in order to work on the project. Uh, so we're talking 10,000, you know, 10,000 people and um, over 20 years. It's, it was a tremendous project. And it's also not just Europeans and, and Americans. Um, you know, I mean, we have people, uh, countries all over the world. We have all continents, except for maybe, of course, Antarctica represented, but uh, <laughs> all continents represented. And um, so it's both a tremendous international effort as well as just sheer numbers of people. Wow, that, it, it's incredible. And it's, it's a big, big machine. Uh, bigger than any science, you know, machine I use. I, I use electron microscopes, which can be pretty big, but they're nothing like the size of uh, the Large Hadron Collider. So um, this, of course, is in a um, situated underground and yeah. is uh, set on, you know, there's a, a ring where you accelerate the particles. Yeah, 17-mile um, ring, yeah. 17 miles. Uh, so... Um, we see all these 
pictures and they're beautiful. It's amazing the colors. I I don't know if there's a purpose to the colors, but you know it's certainly a stunning visual uh, image when you see a picture of that. But I don't. I doubt that even gives a sense of how big this really is. Yeah, I mean, inside the LHC ring itself, you know, the, the preferred mode of transportation is a bicycle. And you know that when you have to bike um, around your experiment, that it's gotten it's gotten a little big. Um, <laughs> and and definitely, you know, I mean, to get to one side of the ring, if you're going by car, you know, takes you a good 30 minutes because it's all. One thing I find fascinating about the LHC is that you know it's kind of it's located in a in quite a rural area. I mean Geneva is is nearby, but it's kind of out in the countryside. So you're kind of driving through fields, and you've got tractors, and you've got cows, and then you've got you know a superconducting magnet just kicking it going down the road. You know, so it's this very weird mix of of uh, science and you know farming. Um, in the area, which you also don't really expect, but it's just it's massive. Um, every once in a while, friends and I we have a an annual we, we bike the ring on on the surface, not on not on okay. the okay. And we kind of go to each point, and and it's a good you know we go to each point and we kind of have a picnic or something. So, uh, but but it's a good day's worth of event, you know, to kind of go from one ring to the one point to the next. So when you say points, you're talking about the various detectors um, along the ring. Yeah, so you can access the point at, at eight different points. Um, four of those points are detectors, and, and some of those access points are, are just for um, for access, for services, and so forth. Um, it's as it, it's pretty interesting actually when you when you see it because for many years um, I insisted that that I think it's point six didn't exist, and I thought it was just like a, a, a mystery. Like people said, oh no no, but there's a point six. No no no, that can't exist. That can't exist. <laughs> And it, sure enough, it's a little house. It's because because the residents didn't want a big, ugly warehouse-looking thing, so they built what looks like a home. It looks like a home, and then you realize that there's just gigantic chimney, which is the the steam release for um, part of the LHC. And so you realize, it's like, oh, okay, that's actually not somebody's house. That's point six. That's point six. Interesting. Um, before I uh, ask a, a little bit about the different. Um, detectors that are there. Um, I, I understand that that this machine gets powered up and down to accommodate the power needs of the neighborhood. Is that correct? Um, not not in, in practice. No, actually. So okay. so in in principle, it it can because um, during the winter time in France, which is where most people have electric heating. Um, that the power demands are so high that the LHC had agreed to not run during the winter time. Um, in practice, we can negotiate pretty heavily with the power company and be like, "Oh, come on, we." Because sometimes, as we're approaching uh, this, they always go into a shutdown kind of over December, and as we're approaching the shutdown, we're always like, "Oh, actually, can we just can we get a little?" We're very um, we're very greedy uh, physicists, so we we want as much data as we can, and so. We're always begging the power company, like, oh, please, 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 can you uh, give us just a tiny bit more? <laughs> That's um, funny. I like to hear that. So, so this this ring does not just house the Large Hadron Collider. It has other um, detectors. Could you tell us a little bit about those? So, um, so you have the ring with it, which is the collider itself, and then on that ring there are four detectors. There are two detectors which are sort of general purpose which is ATLAS, which is the detector that I work on, and then CMS. And these detectors are big, huge, and their idea is that they're supposed to be ready for anything. That the beams are going to collide, we're going to produce new particles. We have some ideas about what those are, but we're not really sure, and we want to be ready for anything. Okay. Um, so those are ATLAS and CMS. We call those the general purpose detectors. And then we have two specialized detectors, one of which is called ELISE, if you're French-speaking, or ALICE, for the American-speaking, um, and then LACB. And these two detectors have um, a very specialized physics program. Um, ELISE is dedicated in looking at um, what they call the quark gluon plasma. Um, oh. So <laughs> very, uh, yeah, it, don't ask me. It's totally over my head. Um, and then LACB is interested in studying um, the B quark, which is the second heaviest of the uh, six quarks in okay. our theory of particle physics. Um, so they have more specialized programs, um, equally interesting, but they they kind of 
had a very clear physics goal about what they were trying to measure, and we we're just kind of, we'll take it, we'll take anything. <laughs> so the, um, uh, it, it seems like, you know, really specific and specialized, uh, and, you know, for a very, you know, in a very large, a lot of um, manpower and money put into creating these things that are looking for very specific and possibly, you know, somewhat esoteric things um, that, you know, you know the average person may or may not care about. So, yeah, how do you how do you answer when people are you know maybe are curious or critical of this kind of you know uh, expand expensive you know um, and and tedious sort of work that you know they don't understand what that has to do with their real life? Yeah, I think you know I mean, but. Science always has to be kind of done at a level at which you're you're sort of saying you know that you're trying to to understand something that you don't know about the universe, and I think that if you talk to people and you rephrase the question and you say something like you know why is it that understanding the stars are interesting? Um, why were they interesting to Galileo, for example? Everyone understands that they were like well it's clear that it's a mystery and we don't understand anything about it and and part of humanity is to kind of try to understand things that are beyond your day-to-day -day needs. And sure, the LHC is definitely expensive, but it's not, I mean, in the scale of uh, governments, it's not expensive. Um, the governments are certainly much, much more expensive. And most of that money actually goes into people. Um, you know, there was a certain amount of money that went into building it, um, but a lot of that money goes into employing people, employing students, um, students who then use those skills to go on to and work in industry, uh, you know, and apply those science-based skills in, in, you know, for, for direct applications. Um, so I, I feel that society does gain from it. It's hard to say we gained X, Y, and Z, um, but I think that the process of, of making discoveries has always been an important element of, of humanity. Right. Well, I of course agree, but uh, <laughs> I, I so I'm um, uh, I, I'm curious. So you did a lot of actual integrating and in, uh, you know uh, actual physical work on this machine. Now that that's done, do you do anything in in the machine anymore? Do you get called on for repairs, or is this just sort of a uh, they yeah, have other technicians. It's it, it, it kind of goes in, in cycles. So um, so during there are periods where the LHC um, goes into an upgrade phase. So it tries to improve upon itself and at that time the experiments then also we also upgrade our own electronics and so forth. Um, now is one of those times actually. So the LHC is in a shutdown and, and we're upgrading, um, improving the detector. Um, and then the LHC will start back up again in, in January or February-ish. And so during this time, there is more actual physical work to be done because you have to, there's hardware, it has to go in, it has to work. Um, but in the meantime, like once, but then when the LHC is running and it's producing a lot of data, then we have to analyze that data. Um, and so then during that time where the LHC is running, most of what I do is includes a lot of computing um, and doing, you know, because we're, we're, we have billions of events, and there's no way you can look at every event, ah, event 1,526, great. Um, you don't look at every one, um, so you have to use computing techniques in order to analyze the data to say, ah, yes, this is something new, or no, that's, um, that's a standard model process, we already, we know that, it's old, um, boring, uh, so I kind of switch between computing and electronics and it's it's a nice balance because when you get frustrated with your computer you can go work on hardware and when you get frustrated with the hardware you go back to your computer so uh. yes it is it is nice that's what <laughs> I, I personally like about lab work because sometimes you're you're working in the lab and then sometimes you go just do some thinking some reading some writing right. yeah it's, it's 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 a nice balance I I'm personally an experimentalist myself so um, now let's talk a little bit about the movie itself. So obviously, this took them several years to film, and um, you know, it, and I'm sure they followed several people. But how did they pick and find you? 
Um, well, I mean, so definitely in the beginning, the, the film crew was following lots of people, and um, and I, you know, was happy, bubbly, you know, to help and, and join it in. Um, I think in the end, it was kind of luck, actually, because many colleagues of mine who, who I knew who were also filming for this um, film in the beginning, you know, went to take positions in, in other places, um, you know, back in the States, for example, or, you know, in other um, countries, and, and then they just weren't there. And so when the film crew would come, you know, they couldn't really continue their story. Um, yeah, but in the end, it was... Actually, I don't think any of us knew who was going to be in the film until we all saw it. Saw it. And actually, the, when the film premiered at the Sheffield Film Festival, gosh, over a year ago now, mm -hmm. um, there were a tremendous number of people in the audience who had at one point filmed. And at the end, I remember us all talking, saying, like, oh, I'm sorry, you weren't in it, or oh, I was in it. or <laughs> So I think we were all a little... Uh, you know, it was it was a mystery to us as well who was going to uh, be in the film or not. But oh, that that's interesting. That's interesting. So you couldn't hold on to like, ooh, I'm you know, I've got myself a place in a film that's going to do really well. There's no way to know. There's no. I mean, you kind of near the end. Um, you know, they were then when they were filming and they were trying to get some wrap to the story. You could tell that okay, they they wanted to film more and more with certain people, and so you could kind of have a hint like okay, those must be the people that were going to be in the film. But I don't think I saw a single second of the footage until I watched the entire thing in the theater. It was um, it was a very surreal experience. Um, <laughs> well, it, it's a marvelous film, and I you know I don't know how many people out there watching have um, seen it, but it, it is so well done, and it is you know beautifully filmed, wonderfully edited, um, and the story uh, goes along so well. And I assume that once they you know um, made the announcement about uh, possibly finding the Higgs, like that probably influenced you know their final editing of this film. So yeah. why don't you speak a little bit about the, the Higgs, you know, the, this this story arc that they ended up uh, following. Well, I mean, certainly it was a surprise ending for us, too. Um, you know, I mean, that's the, the kind of interesting thing about documentary, right, which is that the kind of the, the story is uh, out of your control. <laughs> the story is what it is. Um, yeah, we were really stunned, I mean, because... You know, the LHC had a, had a devastating accident um, in 2009, and, and this was, I, I think, you know, the entire CERN during that period was just completely depressed. I mean, it was really, you'd go into the cafeteria during lunch, and everyone would just have their heads down, and, uh, yeah, and it was really, it was a really hard experience to come back from, and the LHC came back at a much lower energy um, than the original design, at half the energy um, of the original design. And I think after that experience, people were very pessimistic that we would even be able to discover the Higgs with the data that we had. Um, I mean, we were happy to have any data. I mean, just we were thrilled to have any data. But there was not a whole lot of expectation that we were going to discover the Higgs. And so I think everyone kind of had mentally um, gotten and mentally gotten to the point where they were thinking 2015 for the Higgs. Um, I certainly, I think, told Mark, the director, Ten times that it was going to be in 2015, because he would always be like, "When do you think there's going to be a Higgs discovery?" And I'm like, "2015. Don't talk to me until 2015." <laughs> um, and so when it became clear that the data looked really good and that the detector itself was operating really well, and we really understood the detector, and that you know, then you start to see the first hints of it, and, and everyone was kind of kind of getting excited and. Um, and of course, you don't know what the other experiment is doing, and so you're kind of like, do they see something? And mm -hmm. um, so I think it was when we actually had the announcement in July. I think it was um, it was a, it was a big surprise for us all because we kind of were like, yes, we don't have to wait till 2015. We've we've discovered it now, and it was a uh, it was a great celebration. You know, I loved. I mean, you know, even before I saw the film. But I love that uh, Peter Higgs was in the audience, and even though it's not just him, right? This 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 particle is not just about him but it you know just that he's so moved like it's named for him but it's that he was so moved it was just such an amazing uh, thing yeah. to watch and yeah and, definitely and I think um, it, you know there's a the whole thing of um, the sort of a 
a general populace uh, placing an importance on it because somewhere along the la li lines it got named the God particle uh, yeah. to sort of highlight its importance. So, uh, for those who may not be aware, could you explain what the Higgs is and why it's important and why you were looking for it? So, so definitely physicists do not like the term um, the God particle, and I'll explain why. So the Higgs is, we have this very successful theory of particle physics, and it was just really spectacular because you're talking about, you know, things that are minuscule in comparison to atoms. Um, and we've been testing this theory extensively for 30, 40 years, and and the experiments line up exactly with the theory for the most part. This is like bam, bam, bam. So you have this extremely successful theory, and one critical element, actually the most critical element of that theory is that there is a, a, a particle called the Higgs particle, or a field called the Higgs field, which is what gives mass to all the other particles. And so without it, the whole theory kind of falls apart. But then also the concept of, of mass or weight, um, nothing would have mass or weight, which as you can imagine is kind of a, a critical element of the universe. Um, so, so it's kind of a big deal. And, um, and it, this was proposed by Peter Higgs, you know, 40 years ago. And for 40 years, people have been trying to see it, and ex collider experiments had been built to produce it and, and didn't because the energy wasn't enough. And so this was kind of the, we, we kind of all knew that the standard model had to be correct, but, but we could never prove it. Um, until we actually produced the Higgs particle. And so this was kind of, I mean, to wait 40 years um, for someone, you know, you write down a theory, you submit a paper, and you've got to wait 40 years to see if you're right. Um, yeah, I, can, I would be crying at the yes. announcement as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So while we're on the Higgs, we actually do have a question from someone uh, that is says, what is your take on the Higgs boson, and do you think we will have a feasible application of the manipulation of the Higgs field within your lifetime? And if so, what do you think the product would be, and how would it help people? Are we even there? <laughs> yeah, I think that since it took us uh, 30 years to build the LHC, um, not in my lifetime will we have I mean, uh, an ap applicable um, sort of source of the Higgs or reason to use the Higgs. I think what, what the Higgs does, what it does most for us um, is it helps us understand the, the fundamental principles of nature. And I think there are, are many other applications of physics um, which a better understanding of the fundamental principles of physics would improve, you know, technology applications. So the Higgs itself, um, I think not, not, not in my lifetime, probably not in even the next generation's lifetime. But I think our, our understanding of the fundamental principles of nature, uh, will that lead to something new? This I have no doubt of. What, what it is yet? I don't know. We're still working on that. But this I have no doubt of. Right. That's one thing I love about science, that you know, <laughs> we, we, you know, we don't understand that what could possibly come when, when a discovery is made, and it could take a very long time, especially if it takes 30 years to build the next instrument to measure. This, this is always the, the challenge with particle physics, it's just the, the turnaround is, is unfortunately slow. Um, yeah. But uh, the technology that we design to build the collider is always, uh, always has industry applications. Oh, that's true. That's a lot like uh, NASA. Like when you know they create, they you know work on a technology to get people to space to keep them safe, to get the next thing to space. Then those can be turned around and brought back, you know, uh, for practical applications. So that's that's true. That's amazing. Yeah, exactly. This this is a lot with the a lot like the LHC. Yeah. So uh, because um, you are in the position of a woman being a physicist and this seems to be somewhat of a rare breed. Uh, guess what we get to talk about that? <laughs> so women biologists aren't all that rare. Um, I mean, as we get to, you know, higher and higher, that's a completely different discussion, you know, as far as faculty, tenured faculty, women tend to fall out of the ranks. But this is seen more acutely in uh, the hard sciences and engineering. And um, the people who follow me closely know uh, that my daughter is a junior in the College of Engineering 
studying physics. She doesn't quite know what to do. Um, but she sees acutely that she's not a large percentage of the population, that women are not highly represented. They are by no means like, uh, you know, electrical engineering where it's maybe 2%. Mm. But, you know, uh, it's not as, it's certainly not 50%. So can you speak a little bit to that about being a woman in the field of physics and as, you know, special challenges? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, so actually the in ATLAS, which is, of course, a collaboration of 3,000 people, uh, we're 20%, actually 20%. all of 20, 20 across the board. So, uh, so yeah, but which is definitely much, much less than 50. Um, and I think that's where we would all like to be. I think that, that physics faces a, a couple of big challenges when it comes to women in physics, which is that, um, that you know, many, you kind of have to know that you want to go into physics before you start in that career path. And I think that physics kind of has a bad rap about, you know, what, who physicists are. I mean, you know, I never identify with the Einstein model of physics. You know, the guy looks like a geek. He can't comb his hair. He was obviously an extremely intelligent person, um, which I can respect, but, you know, I'm not going to identify with that kind of figure. And so I think there needs to be kind of a, a bit of a makeover to physics itself. And I, one of the reasons I'm very excited about the film is that I think it gives a much more realistic view of what people do on a day-to-day -day day in physics. And I hope that then it kind of comes back and, and helps change the image of physics such that um, you know, younger women who are, you know, thinking about what they want to do at college would say, like, you know, actually maybe physics isn't boxes on an incline. Maybe it is a little bit more exciting and uh, it would be something for me. And uh, so I, I do think physics needs a major makeover um, in terms of, of what it means to be a physicist today. And uh, the Big Bang Theory, although funny, um, does not help. Uh, and, uh, and, yeah, and I think also that, that you know, that, that younger girls especially, um, I, I do a lot of, I, I personally do a lot of try to outreach within the ages of, of 9 to 12, actually, because I think, for me, this is an area where I feel that, that um, you know, that, that girls are not discouraged, but they're not encouraged um, at that age. And, and if they're undecided, um, then kind of the current pulls them away from physics, um, whereas if they're decided, then they go, no problem. Uh, yeah. But if they're undecided, um, there needs to be maybe some gentle nudging um, in the direction to say, you know, have you considered um, science um, because you do well at math or you do well in um, the sciences at school, you know, like, maybe you should think about going that way. And, um, so I think more programs like this could also help uh, get more, pe more women into physics. Yeah, well, definitely. You know, to to highlight, um, you know, my my hope is one day we won't be like, oh, it's a woman in physics. Look, or it's a woman in science. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Look, what a strange creature that is. Um, yeah, you know, exactly. where it, it just won't matter. You know, because um, now you know there was probably a time where there weren't many women physicians, women lawyers, but they didn't need a big uh, push, a big specific push towards you know, we want women lawyers and women doctors. What happened with them was that we all know what doctors do. We all know what lawyers You know, like, so there's an understanding of these professions. So it was easier when, when societal views started to change, you know, to say women could do anything. These were easy uh, careers for women to go ahead and choose if they were bright and motivated because people knew what that is. So I think a lot of it has to be, one, what, what do scientists do? What does a physicist like you do? And to see that there are women doing these things and they articulate science and they are visible. And one good thing the Particle uh, Fever movie did was to show you, you, I mean, you were probably about the only person they showed running <laughs> and biking and rowing and all of, yeah, all no, of those things. But you look like a real person. You're a real person doing things. And there are a lot of girls, you know, active in sports and all. but. You know, maybe they think science is going to make them hide in a room and not talk to anybody. But the, another thing this uh, film showed was that so much collaboration, so many people working together, um, which I think is critical. Uh oh, we yeah. lost her. Uh, 
there you are. And I think you know that, that's also one thing that you know I never appreciate. Oh, am I still here? You're here. You're, you have be... we're, I'll see if I can get your image back. Unfortunately, breaking up here. Okay. So um, yeah, I think that's. Hey, go ahead and talk. We can hear you. Okay. Let's see. Uh, okay. Hold on. So I think it's another thing you're supposed to be thing that I think you know I never appreciated before going into to uh, physics, which is <laughs> technical problems. It's okay. Yes. I can. That's okay though. We can hear it might you. Be my connection and your mouth is matching. Occasionally cutting out in the middle of nothing. I think I think it'll come back. We can hear you. So if you can go ahead and answer, and we'll uh, hopefully it'll catch up in a moment. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, the, the environment is extremely international, and I think that, that you know, this kind of revamping of the image, um, especially, you know, for me, always, it's always like, sometimes it comes down to fashion, you know, like you, you go into CERN, and, you know, especially because there's such a large international community and everything like this, that, that you know, you think, this is not, you, you kind of have this image of what physics should be, it should be totally geek, you know, that's the American image of, of physics. Um, when you go to CERN and you're just like, wow, those are amazing shoes. Um, <laughs> and you're just like, this is, and it's, it's a great way to kind of, you think like, okay, I totally had that wrong about physics. And um, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that, you know, this, we need to sort of modernize the image of what it means to do science. And it's not about sitting on a blackboard. Some people do that, but it's not about sitting on a blackboard writing out equations. Um, you can do that if you want to, but if you want to also, um, you know, build state-of-the-art electronics or, um, you know, search, do data mining, searching for, you know, crazy new physics signatures and things like this, uh, we do that too. And that's, in my opinion, much more exciting. <laughs> well, I, it, I mean, it was a great show. Uh, I think, who, who was the other woman? Fabiola? Yeah. Um, yeah, so she, she was just, you know, marvelous. And you think, this woman you know, seems at once gentle, but also at once she's not going to take any, you know, crap from anybody, and she's just going to do her work. And, you yeah. know. I, and I agree. I think the film does that very nicely, which it shows, it shows people, like, as, as they are in real life. It was very real. I mean, I think that when, when, the, when the movie was shown at CERN, um, that was the most common impression that people had. They were like, that. we, we all felt that this captured what it was actually like to work in physics on this experiment. Because oftentimes, sometimes when you see, you know, news um, uh, presentation, like on the on the news, sometimes when the highlights are and stuff like that, you kind of feel like they kind of have this very distant relationship. Like, look what scientists are doing now. Isn't that amazing? Like how, like, like we're some sort of zoo animal or something like this, you know. Um, whereas the film, I think, really captures, you know, sometimes we have good moments, sometimes we have bad moments. Um, Sometimes we're excited, sometimes we're totally depressed. Uh, and this really gives us what it was actually like to be, you know, there during that time. Yeah, I think that's doing such a great service. So I'm going to bounce back to uh, something you said about um, uh, math that you wrote in the Huffington Post. And you talked about how, um, you know, math is important. But maybe we shouldn't let people who you know who think they're not good at math be dissuaded from going into science. And the interesting thing is, when I read that, I was reminded of uh, the eminent biologist E.O. Wilson, who wrote a very similar thing, uh, uh, like about a year ago, and was given a lot of grief for that. That you know, he, he said, you know what? Go start doing science. Go start doing it and then you will get the math as you go along as you need it or you will form a collaboration with someone who can help you with the deeper statistics or the whatever that you know so that math is important but it should if you're if you think if you've got something in your mind that says oh, well I'm not good at math so I'm not going to do science then it shouldn't dissuade you and I felt like you were saying the same thing yeah I, I mean I can't agree more I mean it's it's um, you know I feel that that math is a very powerful tool. Um, and of course I'm an experimentalist, so all my theory friends would totally disagree with me, but math is a very important tool, and it's a great 
tool in order to be able to describe um, the universe in, in the case of my field or describe nature. But the point of math is to is a tool in which to try to understand nature. And there are many ways in which you can probe and understand nature, and it doesn't have to be through math. And I mean, I of course have studied math. Um, because it's a part of you know the process, and no knowledge of some math, of course, is important. Um, but you know, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis in trying to understand the fundamental principles of nature doesn't involve equations. And I, I feel strongly that if you're not interested in math, that doesn't mean that you can't be a good scientist. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't you know make uh, its discoveries or contribute to human knowledge of of, of science. Um, it is a tool, um, and so it can be helpful. But, but you know, I feel that sometimes, in, in certainly in my own education, that there has been so much emphasis on understanding the math, and I always think of it as math is just a description, really. Um, nature is what you're trying to understand, and math is just what you've created in order to try to understand it. Um, I, I know many physicists will disagree with me, but. But I always persuade my students to say, "Look, um, if you can't do, if you don't like the math, it doesn't matter. You can still be very successful as a scientist." And I, I would love to get that message through to students, especially in high school, who are suffering through the math. I just let them know I've also suffered through the math, and uh, you get to a certain point, you can forget about it. <laughs> Right. Well, it, and I, I'm in total agreement there because I had a tough time with math in high school. I, did, I was not surrounded by people who were natural at math and uh, like for whatever reason I didn't get along with the nun who taught most of the math <laughs> in high school. Um, you know, so I didn't feel comfortable going to her. So when I got to college, I did struggle. But what happens is then when you are finally on a project that needs the math, you are motivated to learn that math that you need for that particular project. And I also had the experience that when I uh, did take university level physics, it's the math suddenly started to make sense because I understood, um, you know, where, where, whatever it is, whether you're colliding blocks or, you know, <laughs> dropping balls, it's like I had a practical experience with that. And to see that, that, you know, you can describe that mathematically suddenly made math seem really come alive. So I think there's not just one way to get to the math you need to know. And, you know, granted, I may not know as much math as either my two oldest kids who are in the hard sciences, but I know a lot more math than a lot of people. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely I mean, I actually do sort of, um, you know, like math in, in some sense, but I always kind of put it in the idea that it's a tool, um, that it's something that's a skill that you learn in order to help you with your science. It's um, but what motivates me to do science is not my motivation to learn math. That's uh, that's for sure. <laughs> so um, we're we're coming to the end of our discussion here, and I just want to make sure uh, I didn't forget to uh, to give you the opportunity to speak on something that maybe you think is really really important uh, before we sign off. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to this discussion? Well, I would just like to say that I, I hope people take the opportunity to see the film, and said I, I really enjoyed. Um, being in it, and I think that uh, definitely, I, I think that the particle physics is extremely exciting, and um, and I hope that you know that I can at least share part of that excitement uh, with the community um, to try to you know kind of to break the cycle of uh, you know kind of the day to day kind of maybe remove yourself and think about something totally different, um, such as like the fundamental properties of, of the universe. Um, is time always well spent? I think. I think uh, I agree. Uh, you should people should go out and watch the the film. I see Monica's uh, technology is trying to fail on her, so hopefully she'll come back before yeah, I sign so off. But <laughs> <laughs> if you have not seen uh, Particle Fever, please do uh, try to go to their website, particlefever.com, and see uh, you know where it might be showing near you in a theater, so you can enjoy that experience. And as in this town, uh, there were scientists where I'm in the university town. There were scientists there for a uh, chat afterwards, uh, where you can get your questions answered. Um, so that's occurring across the country. But also now you can uh, pick it up on iTunes 
as of yesterday. And uh, you should be able to, as of July 15th, uh, get be able to get a copy um, from your uh, video on demand streaming, various ones. Uh, so just go to the website to find out more about that. Uh, you won't be sorry you saw the movie. It's really great. I'm hoping to see that it could be shown in high schools and um, middle schools, I think, as an inspiration to show what physicists do and that physicists are just, you know, regular people doing something they love. So uh, since it seems Monica has disappeared, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, get yourself a chance to watch the, the movie. And um, thank you, Monica, for joining us, if you can hear me. And um, we'll see you again sometime. Monica, are you there? Thanks. I think I'm still there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hear your voice, but we can't see you anymore. So. I am there. I just I don't know what happened. Okay. Well, great. Thank you, Monica, so much for joining us. Yeah. Well, you know, technology. <laughs> what can you technology. say? Technology. <laughs> well, you know, as long as it doesn't fail, we well, thanks for having me. Important experiments, and that's what counts. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs> bye. All right. Bye. Thank you so much.